The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, if you're joining us and this is not your first time this year, you will be hearing a different voice. I'm subbing in for Mrs. Sills, who is on vacation. Um, she actually has taken over for me doing the Ask the Expert webinars. I've done them for the last couple of years. Um, before that, I assisted Sean Lim, uh, who was at 610 World Championship team. And uh, before that, uh, John Hobbins did it. So we're very lucky to have uh, first senior mentor, Sarah Sills, doing it now. And uh, I'm happy to sub in for her for a couple of weeks. Um, this week, uh, we're going to talk about awards. Um, but as you should know, as we do every week, we're going to record, we're in fact recording right now, and at the end of the event, um, the broadcast, we're going to post the uh, recording on our First Canada YouTube channel, and then we'll post on uh, <clears throat> our First Canada Facebook page um, the link to there and so forth. And uh, if you want a copy of the slides um, please don't hesitate to email me my email will show up at the last uh, on the last slide but um, it's p keenan at firstinspires.org and as i said um, in my uh, promo uh, blast from uh, i think the first canada facebook page we are um, potentially giving out some First Canada swag, since if uh, you don't know who I am and you've been at a first event, then you've seen me because typically I'm in the swag tent or the swag area selling swag. So right now we have two attendees. One is Mike Varsava, who is a mentor. I can see he's a mentor from the uh, Atomic Dishwashers up in uh, Owen Sound in that area. And uh, so Mike, you email me after this and I'll make sure that I have some swag for you at your first event. And we also have uh, a second person on there, and I'm gonna say it's Satya Jutada. So Satya, please do the same thing. Email me at pkeenan at firstinspires.org, and we'll make sure to get some swag to you. Okay, right away, Mike has a question. Oh, no, it's not a question, he's just saying thank you. So thanks for joining us. If you do have any questions as we go along for our uh, presenters, please um, include them in the chat box. The chat box is down at the bottom of your screen. Type in your questions, or uh, there's a question box and a chat box, so you're, you're welcome to type in the questions there, and uh, we'll get to them as we go along. So our basic agenda for today is um, there's a little bit of intro, first news and updates, and there's, uh, we're gonna have uh, Anne and Ava from Team 6878 out of Hamilton talking to us about non-technical awards. And then Pram from Team 4946, the Alpha Dogs out of Bolton, he's gonna talk about um, uh, some of the technical awards. However, just to go through some quick points before we get started, um, most of you know about our safety badge program. It was actually started by Team 1241. Um, <clears throat> somehow I have inherited it and we do have an online quiz that's there. I just noticed today that we went over 15,000 quizzes taken. Uh, there are prizes. You can get your bronze safety badge. You can earn it and pick it up at an event from the swag booth from me. And this year we have the first of our bronze, uh, our silver safety badges. And to get your silver safety badge, you need to actually do something. So if you've already done that thing or you've earned a Red Cross or some other safety organization first aid course or CPR course, which is near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, and there are other things that you could do. You're welcome to contact me and find out more or contact me and uh, provide me with your a, a screenshot of your uh, uh, certification for one of those safety uh, first aid courses and I would be happy to provide you with a silver badge if you've already earned your bronze badge. So <clears throat> new to, um, if you're new to First Tech Challenge, which is pretty much everybody in Ontario because this is the first year for it, um, the um, 
there is a jumpstart program which uh, if you go to that link it'll provide you with lots of information about how to get your get a team started for next year um, the registration starts in May after the world championships are over and um, there's some benefits to doing that in advance including getting some of the entry fee covered as well so there's more information that you can see there <clears throat> and there's also an FLL jumpstart and the FLL jumpstart um, uh, is pretty much the same thing you can get your registration covered you will get uh, uh, a challenge set earlier than maybe usual uh, although that's still an initial purchase and you can get started um, getting ready for next year's challenge and we have lots of information about how to do that and including some taking advantage of our CAN code to learn a little bit about those skills. If you're an FRC team and you are close enough to a venue that has of uh, one of the events that you're going to you might wish to take home some of the carpet um, that at that event as I mentioned in the pre-show to Param, Ava, and Anne. Um, each district event uh, uses new carpet, and we like to provide the carpet to teams that are close by so that they can use it to uh, drive their robot on when they're practicing and maybe set up part of a field for the next season. We've seen the last few years always be using carpet, so that's something to consider. The person that you need to um, contact is John Hobbins, who's a regional director for. First Robotics in Ontario. And so now we have with us um, actually two members of Team 6878, Saint Jean uh, Brebeuf Robotics Team Odyssey. They're out of Hamilton. And we have with us Anne and Ava who are going to talk to us about some non technical awards. As, as uh, we we're talking with Ava, it's a third year, our Anne. It's a third year team, um, so they're excited for what they can do. They, are, they were talking a little bit about their robot, and it sounds like they're excited for what it can accomplish in their events when they, they compete this year. Anne is the business manager of the team and award submitter, and uh, she was recently featured in the Hamilton Spectator talking about the impact of FIRST Robotics on her. So without much further ado, um, take it away, Anne and Ava. Hello everyone, my name is Ava and I'm safety captain for our team Odyssey 6878. Um, I'm here joined by Anne Lenora, who is our business manager. We're here today to talk about how your team can achieve non-technical awards during competitions. Next slide. There are nine possible non-technical awards you can win. Hopefully we're not missing any. Each of these awards come with a unique set of requirements and submissions, but don't be intimidated. Next slide. We'll break down the year in terms of robotics. There is a pre-build season, build season, which is occurring right now, competition season, and post-competition season. During each term, there are certain things that you need to keep in mind before you start gearing up for award submissions. Next slide. Almost every non-technical award is looking for generally the same thing, how you manage your team in terms of whatever the award is specific to. For example, the Safety Animation Award is essentially asking you to make a minute video about how you should maintain, how you should manage your team in terms of safety. Next slide. I would say pre-build season is the least busiest time of the robotics year. From the spam of September to January, you can do some outreach, gain new sponsors, and start planning for what awards you will be aiming for that year. Next slide. So while you're doing outreach events, keep track of how many people you reached and how much money you raised if you had raised money. Also, take note of the date of the outreach event as well as how many team members volunteered. When you have all these stats to refer to, it will be easier when you're writing essays 
talking to judges, or being interviewed. Next slide. Also, remember to take photos and videos throughout the year. This way, you have a diverse amount of photos for displaying in the pit, and you have footage for those videos. So, always remember that the people in the photo and video are wearing the required safety equipment. The use of safety equipment, or a lack of, definitely reflects on your team's sense of safety. Have an equal mix of both robot and team photos, so you have media for technical and non-technical award submissions. Take photos of every team outing, no matter how small, because you never know. In my opinion, one of the first things a team should invest in is a good quality camera. The quality of your photos and videos can heighten the strength and effectiveness of your team presentation and submissions. You should also keep track of your team numbers, as well as team demographics. This includes the ratio of boys to girls, grades, the ratio of mentors to students, and the total number of mentors. How I try to do this is by sending out a Google survey that asks for these demographics. You can decide how often you go about it. I usually send one in pre-build season, then build season, competition season, and at the end of the year. These demographics can really help you learn a lot about your team's strengths and weaknesses. For example, my team has a pretty equal ratio of boys to girls. However, most of our team members are in grade 11, which isn't very good in terms of team sustainability. Next so, slide. Just before we get to the next one, Ava, I, I wanted to point out something else about the um, why these are important. Yes, they're important for your team for awards, but I'm always getting asked by various people in first, oh, RBC has this grant and it's for, uh, for example, the Memorandum of Understanding is for teams that have a lot of girls on it. And people are asking me, do you know um, teams uh, that have that? And I can check rosters to see that. And so that's why I keep pushing teams, make sure you put your, your team's members on the rosters so that part of that um, can be seen by everybody else. So it's great to be able to put that in awards, but uh, when you talk to the judges, but it's helpful if I know that too, and Kim Cooper knows that from our VP or sponsorship. So it's a, an important thing that you should keep in mind as well. Thank you. Next slide. I would suggest collaborating with a mentor to keep your track of your team finances. Take note of where the money come, came from, where you spent the money, who donated the money, and what level of sponsorship would be earned. Try to stay consistent and accurate as possible, because this award is a great thing to show if you're aiming for the entrepreneurship award. Next slide. A lot of teams tend to miss the animation submissions because they're unaware of the actual deadline. The animation contests are always dur due during pre-build season. This had been our first year actually submitting an animation because we also kept missing the deadline. Although from our experience, here's what we learned. Plan out what stage tips you want to include in the video. Choose what type of animation you're using. Depending on the type of animation, you should estimate the amount of time it would take and plan accordingly. Make a list of what equipment the video will need, such as a microscope, sorry, a microphone, if you want to do voiceover. This is probably the most important tip. Choose a date when the animation should be finished before the actual due date. You never know what problems could come up and a little time extra never hurts. Next slide. And this is one of the things that could earn you a silver safety badge. So we have Team 1360 has submitted one, and so they, the four students that did that, they have earned their silver safety badge. And that was the suggestion from the team as one of the ways that they could do that. So keep that in mind. This tip comes straight from our team animator, which is which is makes a storyboard before you start animating. This way, you have something to refer back to when you're editing the video together. Next slide.
That's all you need to know for pre-build season. And now we're entering build season. This is probably the most hectic time of the year. There will most likely be no time to host outreach events or find sponsors. Next slide. The first thing to do during build season is submit any essays required online. This includes the Chairman's Award, Woody Flowers Award, and the Dean's List Award. The Safety and Digital Animation Award are due in the pre-build season, so there's nothing to worry about for that. And the Entrepreneurship Award requires a physical submission to be handed in at the competition. So Next the other slide. thing that should be mentioned, um, Ava, is that most of those awards, except for the Dean's List Award, have to be submitted by students who are on a roster. So there's a, students are designated as an award submitter. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Yes, thank you. Always keep in mind before you submit the date that the submission portal closes on the first Inspires website. So your lead mentor is supposed to choose one of the two students who are supposed to submit the essay in the first Inspires website before the time period ends. Always read the requirements on the first website before writing. Look for things like character limit and what the judges are actually looking for. Have a group of students dedicated to submitting awards. In our team, we have four people who work solely on award submissions. And if you can, try to have some work done in advance. Next slide. You will also need to prepare your media that, that, that will be displayed in the pit during competitions. Your media are the first things judges, sponsors, and other th teams see when they see your pit, which is very so important. So there are three things that you need. A team banner, like the one we have in the picture, informational team posters and binders for safe for business safety and build. So next slide, please. All right, so um, my name is Anne Lenora. I'm gonna be taking over for the rest of the presentation. I've been um, the student business manager of Odyssey since its rookie year in 2018. So um, when designing a banner, you should keep in mind that a banner should be simple, pleasing to the eye, display your sponsor's logo, as well as your own team logo. Make sure you double check um, with a mentor about the correct sizing, um, just in case it doesn't fit the size of your pit or if your logo is too small for the banner. Next slide, please. So your informational posters act as a guide that presenters can refer to while they're talking to judges. So feel free to be creative with the design and organization of the poster, but keep in mind not to put too much text. Um, the poster you see on the slide right now is our team poster in 2019. And looking at it now, I would even say that's too much text in the outreach section. Um, something I would also strongly suggest is to have a section or even a whole poster dedicated to your sponsors. Um, it's a little cut off at the bottom there, but you could see um, our sponsors organized by our levels, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. Um, next slide, please. So creating your binders. Binders are generally organized into four categories business, outreach, build, and safety, but I must have forgot to include a picture for safety when I made the PowerPoint. Um, when I present to the judges, I like to have my binders open so I can make sure um, that I don't miss any information that I wanted to mention to them. It also helps um, for any visuals that I couldn't fit onto the, um, to the poster or as well as any information that I wanna um, definitely bold over. Next slide, please. So um, the business binder, you should always include an executive summary, how you organize your team, 
your marketing strategies, sponsorship levels, and accurate statistics of outreach events, specifically fundraisers. Um, also remember to include your team population and your finances. Your business finder will help a lot if you're trying to go for the um, entrepreneurship award. This is an award I would definitely suggest for rookie and second year teams um, because it is just, it's really just paperwork, I would say, um, keeping track um, of your finances and how you run your team um, business-wise. Next slide, please. Um, so to explain further about the executive summary, um, the executive summary should include the basic and most important parts um, of how um, of your business plan. Always double check statistics with a mentor. For example, um, number the ratio of mentors to students. Make sure your layout is consistent and neat and organize the information in a way that is easy to navigate so when you're presenting to the judges you don't get lost in the information next slide please so for the safety binder always include safety requirements in the pit um, include an emergency plan, a step-by-step -step procedure for certain situations, um, for example, a battery spill, and also have safety checklists for the drive team, the pit team, scout team, and so on. Next slide, please. So keep the step-by-step -step procedures simple and easy to read. Um, I like to put um, our safety procedures in point form. Um, we also like to make our font size a little bigger than the norm, just in case. Pretty much we just want to keep it as uh, simple and easy to read as possible, just in case um, if the situation were to happen and someone was panicking, we'd like um, for something to be easy to read, even when you're panicking. Um, include a table of contents so team members know which page to refer to if a certain situation pops up. Have a page that states where safety tools are placed in the pit, such as um, fire safety equipment and the first aid kit. Always keep your binder in an obvious place to find and make sure your teammates know where it is. Next slide, please. So during competition season, certain awards are only applicable during um, while you're at competition, such as the Judges Award, Team Spirit Award, GP Award, and the Safety Award. Uh, these awards I would especially suggest towards our rookie teams just because um, it's more um, in performance during the competition. Um, next slide, please. So while you're um, in competition, judges will come to your pit and ask you questions. So when you're presenting to the judges, make sure you know information about your team beforehand. Have your binders ready and set up nicely. Whenever the drive team comes back with the robot, the pit can get pretty crowded. So make sure you place your binders somewhere that can be easily accessible as well. So when the judges arrive, always shake um, the judge's hand and introduce yourself. Have a small team of people dedicated to talking to the judges. We usually have um, two or three people at a time, a presenter and our safety captain. Um, most importantly, be confident. Judges are very friendly and easy to talk to. They're just curious and they wanna ask more questions about your team and your robot. If you actually do get nervous and you forget some information, um, always remember that you can refer back to your posters or binders just in case. So, um, for the Team Spirit Award, the Team Spirit Award is achieved through exceptional partnership and teamwork, furthering the objectives of FIRST. And that is a direct quote um, taken from the FIRST um, website. When you're with the judges, try to show them how your team unifies itself throughout the season, as well as how you show your team spirit. Judges also look out for cheering in the stands for both your own team and other teams. 
this is also an award that I think um, rookie teams could look at, um, if you, especially if you have um, a large quantity of team members. So the GP award is a dis achieved by displaying gracious professionalism both on and off the field. Your team can be GP by sharing the resources you have with other teams, keep a good attitude on and off the field, cooperate well with other people in the competition, and that includes everyone, mentors, judges, and teammates alike. And you should also help other teams to the best of your ability. Next slide, please. So the judges award is a little more tricky just because there's no specific sets of requirements that you need to reach. However, um, some tips to keep in mind when you're talking to the judges present any unique features of your team. Some examples would be an outstanding outreach event or program that your team has started or if you have a good ratio of boys to girls. Have a methodical speech ready when you're waiting in the pit. Um, try to have a general outline of what you're saying. For example, I have a general outline um, when I'm talking to judges. So I will state an achievement or a challenge, then how um, we built up to that achievement or how we solved the challenge and how this affected your community. So the community in terms of um, yourself, your team, your uh, school, and so on. Next slide, please. So post-competition is the best time to reflect on what you did right and wrong. Then you can reflect on what you can do better next year. Next slide, please. Our team likes to have a meeting set up just to talk about um, next steps. We ask four questions. What did we perform best at? What have we learned? What could we improve? And what new thing should we try next year? Um, write the answers in a document. And then when next year arrives, look back on it as you prepare for award submissions yet again. Next slide, please. Uh, now that there's more free time, you can go back to hosting outreach events and contacting um, potential sponsors. Try to go um, bigger for your outreach events so you can include them in your non-technical award submissions next year. Next slide, please. If you have any extra questions after the webinar is over, you can contact our email odyssey6878 at gmail.com or our Twitter or Instagram. Um, both of them are at FRC6878. Thank you. Thank you, Anne and Ava. That was great. Lots of good tips for all sorts of teams. Um, again, just a couple of reminders uh, from my end, what I have to sometimes deal with. Have the team members on the roster so that you can pick an awards presenter um, and not leave it to the last second. Most of the awards that have essays, the essay length doesn't change. So as Anne explained and they've explained, you can sort of prepare a little bit in advance for when it's due uh, in the preseason when you have a little time. So these are all great tips. Um, and I would definitely uh, contact Anne and Ava at their email address there if you had any more questions or you wanted to run something by them, that would be a great thing uh, to do in advance. So thank you again, girls. Yeah, no problem. Um, and now we're going to move on to uh, the, the technical awards. And we have a presentation here from Param, who is on Team 49460 the Alpha Dogs. And uh, Param was, or I guess still is currently, until someone replaces you, Param, a Dean's List winner. Is that right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that must have been pretty exciting. Well, yeah, it was a bit of a crazy experience, honestly, uh, going from you know, just representing Canada on the world stage was something that was super humbling. The the one thing I would mention about that um, um, is that, unfortunately, uh, not every team in Ontario uh, nominates two students for the Dean's List. So um, I would really think, I, I think that every team has someone they could nominate. Um, and the other thing happens too, is that not every team every year 
nominates a mentor for the Woody Flowers Award, and I think that would be, it's a shame if the team doesn't nominate someone because those mentors are putting in a lot of time and effort. In any case, definitely, I agree with that message. All I can say is apply, apply, apply for those awards. You know, make sure you know you recognize those members on your teams that you know you really think are deserving of these awards and these mentors as well because they put in so much amazing effort and they put in so much hours for you guys. And this is just a really nice way that you can you know nominate them and give back to them. Okay. Uh, absolutely true. Well said. So the technical awards, Param. Okay, let's get this party started. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the technical awards you can win at competitions during your uh, competition season. And next slide, I'm just going to kick it off by talking about general technical award criteria and how the entire judging process works. So what happens is that in your competitions, you have a pay area for any rookie teams who may be first timers here. Just going to give a little bit of a you know rundown on how it all goes down uh, so you have a little pit area where your robot is set up in between matches and you can you know do your maintenance that you need to do and once in a while you'll get these people walking around in these blue polos and they'll say judge on them and what they're going to be doing is going to be asking you different questions about how your robot performs what went into making the robot and they're going to be asking you a whole bunch of questions about the machine and and function of your design, and they're going to try to learn as much as they can about your team as possible. Along with that, they're going to be observing your robot on and off the field. So while you're in a match, they're going to be looking at your robot scoring, they'll look at your autonomous modes, they'll see how well your drivers are performing, they're going to look at all those factors. And off the field, you'll also be able to you know, show them in detail all the little nooks and crannies of your robot, all the little Easter eggs you've stuck on the CAD, and all these cool little things that you can, you know, only showcase in person. Something else that you'll also be talking about is effectiveness of robot. Oh, okay. I think we'll have to go back. <laughs> Something else that you'll also be talking about is effectiveness of robot design. So how well does your robot actually address the game's challenge? So as everyone knows this year, their challenge is going to be manipulating the power cells. You're going to be climbing and you're going to be doing the control panel. So there are all different challenges in this game that your robot has to address. And your judges will see how effective that you've accomplished this thing. And this also goes hand in hand with planning of game strategy and strategy priorities. So when you're in that week one of build season, have you made that list of what your priorities are? Do you know exactly what you want your robot to be functioning like? Do you know what you want your robot to be doing? And having this priority list is super important so that you can make sure that your robot is performing optimally and to the standards that you're setting. Also the planning of a robot. So for example, have you mapped out your robot in sketches? Have you had a huge whiteboard drawing that your team is gonna offer? Have you actually you know, taken the step to do 3D modeling in CAD and actually made blueprints for your robots so that build team can machine them? Now obviously these things depend on the size of your team. For example, our team has around 60 people on it. So we have a design team that manufactures blueprints for uh, the build team. So that will vary by team, but you also want to make sure that you outline this process. And finally, the most important thing, in my opinion, is that you want to adhere to the engineering and design process. What do I mean by that? I mean, iterate, iterate, iterate. You always want to be getting constantly better. You want to be prototyping. And you want to make sure that you're learning from your mistakes and making your robot the best it can be for competition. Next slide. So the first award I want to talk about is the creativity award. So here you can see the criteria that the judges will be uh, judging you on. So in the pit, you want to be able to describe the creative and unique features on your robot, and you can trace its conception, design, manufacturing assembly, and deployment. So you want to be able to explain every single facet of that unique mechanism, and you want to walk the judges through your entire brainstorming process. Like in that initial week one discussion, how did that idea come up and why did you specifically choose it to solve the problem? And also it has to be highly original in concept for execution. If every single team on the field, for example, has a tank drive and you're the only team with a swerve drive, well, that's highly original. You're doing something different. You're, you know, separating yourself from the norm. And you want to be able to talk to the judge. Why did you go with that specific type of drive frame, for example? And Getting, uh, letting them get this insight into your team will be very useful when they're considering for this award. 
And since creativity may involve risk of failure, a team's appropriate responses to challenges, including machine failures, can be considered. So say you're, uh, I'm just gonna use one of the examples I have at the bottom here. Say your team is using a grappling hook for the climber for this year's game. Well, a grappling hook, for example, might have trouble aiming or something like that. So you could talk about your prototyping that your team did and uh, the struggles that you had trying to get that to, you know, grasp onto the run consistently. And, and then you can talk about how you learned from it. So how you maybe adjusted the shooter of the grappling hook or something like, like that. And anything that will basically explain to the judges why you went with that process. And also the uniqueness has to have a practical application. It can't just be a mechanism for mechanism's sake. It has to be able to effectively address the game's challenge in a way that nobody else really has considered. Also, another example I have here in this year's game would be maybe low to high height configuration. So for example, maybe a robot can stay uh, in the low height configuration and go under the control panel, and then maybe pop back up to the high height and maybe do some shooting. Who knows? So that would also be a super creative mechanism that I can't wait to see uh, some teams maybe try out. Also, this could be uh, a solid award for maybe rookies or second year teams to go with, because if they have, uh, if they think that you have something really special going on, then you can, you can really highlight that to the judges in this award and you can sell them on what makes your robot so creative. Next slide. So this is another award I think that uh, rookies and second year teams could definitely try for. And the quality award means that the entire team demonstrates robustness and quality, workmanship, wells, joints, wiring, paint, pit area, tools, control panel, cart, etc. Basically, you want everything in your pit and your workspace and your robot to be super rigidly built. And as it says in the second criteria, it has to be able to withstand the rigors of competition, maintaining functionality including the use of design and redundancy, fail safety that may mitigate failures in competition to gain other advantages. So for example, if you have a robot that, you know, maybe wasn't at the weight limit before, but then you added weight uh, in order to make yourself a super solid defense robot, so you wouldn't get jostled around at all. And maybe you added extra reinforcement to the corners of your frame or something like that. Then you could tell that to the judges and say, hey, we're a robot that we wanted to focus on defense in this year's game. And how did we do that? Well, we added this extra plating, we added this extra shielding, our bumpers are super stable. And say, for example, if our drivetrain breaks, we can easily take it apart and put it right back together. And having little features like these will ensure that the judges know that you have definitely built this robot with quality in mind. You wanna make sure that it's not uh, you know, a sketchy design or something, you've had a detailed plan and you're able to put it together exactly how you intended it. And again, it says workmanship is valued and planned in both the machine and support equipment, and the execution is superb. So once again, you want to make sure that your robot is super solid in anything that it does. And for example, say if you're an offensive robot, you could even still win this award. Say you're an offensive robot that's been shooting the whole game and you've been withstanding some super heavy defense, yet your robot hasn't you know, budged at all, for example, then that would be something super deserving that the judges could totally look out for and say, hey, this team is deserving of the quality award. So this is definitely one to keep an eye for. Next slide. So the next award that I wanna talk about is the autonomous award. And what this award is, is that it tries to evaluate all the teams' performance of the robot's autonomous operations during matches. And in the criteria, it says non-operator guided. And I want to make sure that this, uh, that teams understand that this doesn't mean only autonomous, period. This means that any autonomous activity that your robot does, anything that it's doing automatically or to alleviate driver strain or load on the driver or to make things easier for them, also counts as something that could go towards the autonomous award. And you want to make sure that your autonomous is going consistently and your reliable operation will be weighted more heavily than your max score points. So for example, uh, in 2018, uh, let's say, let's just use that game as an example, uh, you had all the power cubes that you could be scoring. Well, you could have a consistent two cube auto, or you could have a you know hit or miss three cube auto. Well, I think this award is going to be valuing that consistent two cube auto a lot more because 
it makes sure that you know your robot always is in control of itself and its surroundings and it knows where it is and it's able to execute the autonomous programs uh, very well. It also talks about how the robot can understand the surroundings. So this could be through a variety of different things like sensors, for example, a limelight sensor, or I know uh, our friends at CyberCabs will uh, like to use LiDAR, for example, that also works perfectly well. And those things are all uh, different sensors that can contribute to how the robot understands its surroundings and can navigate to its field. And also, uh, they could also factor in the things that could hinder the team's success. So for example, uh, what if you know your robot elevator gets a little bit misaligned? Well, do you have PID closed loop on that to make sure that you know even if it's out of alignment or something like that, it fixes itself? Or maybe your shooter is on that, or you have some autonomous code or an automatic intake. And all these different things that you know work by themselves and make that make the driver's job a little bit easier are all in consideration for the autonomous board. Uh, Another example that I could think of, for example, our last year's robot in 2019 to climb onto the highest level of HAB3, uh, we just had it so that the driver could just hold down one button and the, driver, and the robot would automatically climb and the driver wouldn't have to think about it at all. So even small things like that, not necessarily even during the autonomous period, but if they are, that's fantastic too, uh, using like limelight uh, vision or PID or anything like that on the programming side and sensor side, uh, working together in tandem is how you can win this award. And I think that while this one may be challenging for you know first years uh, rookie teams and second year teams to do, I think it's definitely still one that you could definitely try for. And if you can, then that really you know shows your programming prowess and how much progress you've been making. Next slide. So the industrial industrial design award. And what this award is, uh, you know, one for is having an elegant and efficient and practical design. And the entire machine reflects a system design approach. So they're basically looking at the engineering process in this one. And they're uh, trying to show how your team is considered all factors going into the design. So as you can see, uh, it also, you know, ties in some of the things that we talked about earlier with the quality award. We're talking about reliability, maintainability, rigors of the contest, easy servicing. So you wanna have that portion of the reliability built in, but it's also you know, talking about more than that because it's not only on the rigor and like the robustness of your robot, but also on the other side about the aesthetics and the machine design or a detailed process used to develop it. So for example, say if your team developed uh, you know, five different prototypes for a shooting mechanism this year and you can show the judges like different pictures of how that process changed. You had, uh, you know, you had a shooter that was, you know, maybe two wheels on the side, which uh, changed to a flywheel, and then maybe you added a hood. Lots of different things like that, and that could show iterative design, which is something that the judges are definitely looking for. They also want to make sure that you're looking at a system design approach. Now, what does that mean? The system design approach is basically saying it. You want your game elements to be able to interact with each other and the robot has to be able to seamlessly manipulate things. As I have an example, pause game piece manipulation. So for example, if you have, uh, you know, let's just pick three random components to a robot. You have your intake, you have your internal uh, manipulation and a shooter. Well, how well can your robot intake a piece, then get it to the shooter and then shoot it up. And the more you polish that and the more design and thought that's, that's been put into this, the more you can sell it to the judges and really tell them that, oh, this is what our engineering process has accomplished. And this is how we integrate these different subsystems together. And another example of this I could find, with, uh, again, in the 20, uh, 2019 robot of ours, uh, we had a climber that was also the, integrated with our intake. So the intake sucked in the balls from the front, but also when we went on our skills to climb, the intake pulled our robot forwards onto the platform. So maybe, you know, integrating subsystems, subsystems together and making them work together and finding those optimal solutions is another great way we can uh, you know, try to win this industrial design award. Next slide. Innovation and control award. So this describes the controls innovations and can trace its conception, design, manufacturing, assembly, and deployment. It also talks about how the control system has to be unique and innovative and it's integrated with the machine, human player strategy, et cetera. And it's practical and addresses the game's challenge. So 
the number one thing that I've gotten the most innovation control questions about in my experience of four years of being a pit uh, spokesperson for my team is they're usually asking about sensors. So I've always gotten innovation control judges coming up to me asking, hey, can you just give me a rundown of every single sensor on your robot? And you have to be able to, you know, uh, give them what they're asking for and tell them exactly how these things are integrated. For example, say you have a limit switch somewhere which tells your robot something. Say you have a limelight which tells your robot, oh, this is where I need to shoot. Or maybe you're using it to line up against the wall. Or say, for example, and the, the control panel this year, you need to spin it to get the right colors. Well, you can say that, oh, our color sensor is using this code to you know, accomplish this game's challenge. And uh, these things are uh, very uh, highly sought after by judges and they want to make sure that you're integrating sensors as a part of your initial design. So when you're in that robot CAD, when you're you know, making that initial design, you're thinking about these sensors beforehand. Also, I also uh, added an innovative control method for drivers. Say you have a swerve drive and you have a headless mode. So yeah, your robot will, uh, your robot controls will always be pointed one way instead of you know moving around as a robot does. That's also an innovative way to you know try to gun for this award. And uh, once again, just to reiterate, is really looking for that sen sensor integration with heavy programming, and that's how you can win this award and you know sell your judges on that aspect. So. With this, you also want to have someone in the pit who can speak to the programming aspect of it and also the sensors. Next slide. And finally, the uh, last award that we have is the Excellence in Engineering Award. And what you have to do is describe the engineered feature the, and trace its conception, design, manufacturing, assembly, and deployment. So as the Industrial Design Award previously was, the Industrial Design Award was for excellence in the overall robot and how everything's integrated together. Well, the excellence in engineering world will just maybe pick a few key portions of a robot design that the judges really want to hone in on. Say you have a spectacular intake and the judges really want to take a closer look at it and they want to see all your iterative designs on it. Well, that's what the excellence in engineering award judges will be looking for. And they also want to see the problems that you've experienced during prototyping, testing, and if the solution that you've designed is functional and practical. So for example, say if you have an intake and initially your first prototype wasn't able to grab from the corners of the field and your robot, uh, you know, you, you were doing some thinking and you were like, hey, what if we use some mechanum wheels on the intake? And then once you put the mechanum wheels on the edges, then they were sliding towards the center, you were able to get the balls into your intake. So that would be an example of the iterative design that, you're, that the judges are looking for. And if you can show this, that you're you know, very much thinking through every single com component that you've designed, then you'll be able to win the Excellence in Engineering Award. Some examples I have of things are an accurate shooter because they have to be very, you know, uh, you have to put lots of thought into making uh, that shooter accurate and spend lots of time tuning it and iterating it. For example, maybe a quick climb. So maybe you've nailed down a climb to five seconds where you can balance super duper fast and no other robot on the field can have that. Well, that would really, you know, give you a huge advantage in terms of getting that RP and, you know, getting those points every single match, which would, you know, hopefully lead you to winning the match more often, which would be something that the judges are looking for. Also something maybe crazy like a buddy climb, which would be super cool, then you can guarantee yourself an RP. And that would also be something that, uh, an example mechanism that the judges will look for in excellence in engineering work. Next. So presentation trips, uh, tips and tricks, just some things I've gathered from being a spokesperson for the last four years. You want to have a specialist for everything or a dedicated presenter, and different teams can do this by, by different means. So I know some teams like to have it so that uh, in the pit, they have a dedicated programming person, a dedicated build person, a, de a dedicated electrical person. And whenever the judges ask questions pertaining to those things, they're able to hop in and answer those questions to the best of their ability, and then they'll hand it off to someone else. So say if a build member who may not have all the knowledge about programming that they would like gets asked a programming question, they can just say, oh, here, let me just hand it off to my programming lead. And you can tackle the presentations that way. Or you can have a, a dedicated pres presenter, which is an approach that I prefer, where one person will just memorize all the, you know, the design elements that went into it. They know all the numbers, all the gear ratios, angles, they know literally A to Z of the entire robot, 
And what that can do is that it really frees up other people, say in your pit, to do like repairs and things like that. And also, uh, it's very easy to uh, you know share that message to a judge very easily. Also, we want to emphasize the design process and iterations, and you want to explain the why behind things. Don't just say, uh, "Oh, our robots like that because you know we have to shave off some weight." Well, if you had to shave off some weight, what are the specific things that you have to do to do that? Or say your robot was uh, not moving fast enough. How did you specifically upgrade your gearboxes, or did you maybe choose some new tires, something like that? You want to show the entire process. And remember, the judges are uh, there who are members of industry, and they're just as excited as you are to learn about your robot. And you and they're going to have that same passion that you do, and they're really excited to learn about your robot. So make sure you sell them as hard as you can on it. And at the end of the day, they'll also be evaluating your performance on the field. So make sure that you're you know, accurately conveying all the things that your robot can do. And finally, also have visuals and documentation, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Next. This is the final slide. You want to document your robot strategy, design iterations, programming, electrical challenges in a, some sort of consolidated document. So I know Odyssey was talking about this earlier, which was a great point that they brought up, that you want to have a build uh, type of binder. Uh, I just call it an engineering journal document. And you can have pictures and renders of your robot's CAD, for example, to show progress. Also a weekly breakdown of what your robot's been doing over you know, the build season or what your team has been up to. So maybe you know, week one, you did a strategic breakdown. No, we want to have a drive train. We want to have a climb or things like that. And then maybe in week three, you move on to, you know, you have your chassis together, things like that. You want to show how your team has progressed in the build season. Also, this uh, documentation can have detailed explanations of parts. Say if your, you know, judges can just take the document and they're, when they're in the judging room and they don't want to come back to you for like, you know, to get more information, they have the document right there. It's super handy. They can just refer to it and they'll be like, oh, that's the statistic that we were looking for and things like that. And prototypes and all that stuff can also be included in the documentation. And also a spec sheet or at a glance of the robot is also very useful so that the robots can so that the judges can easily identify your robot in the field and in the judge. And I think that is all the tips I have for technical awards today. Any questions? Woo! That was, that was uh, fantastic, Pram. Thank you very much. Uh, a, Thank couple you. Things, a couple things I would add to both the presentations looking from the different side, uh, both uh, Anne uh, Ava and Param gave a great viewpoint from the team side, but um, uh, we do have a, a view from the judges side. So um, some of you may remember uh, Rona Bredner, who, who passed away recently and was the judge advisor for the province of Ontario. And she did a webinar, an Ask the Experts webinar, a couple of years back where she talked about what it's like when the judges come up and what they're looking for. And the biggest thing that she had said that still stuck with me to this day was the difference she saw at the World Championships when she was judging between American teams and Canadian teams. And the difference was when a judge comes up to the Canadian teams, they would ask them a question, the team would politely answer the question. Once they've answered the question, they would stop. She said the difference with the American kids was that she had experienced was as the judge comes up, the kids ask the judge, what are you here to judge? And the judge says, oh, we're here to judge for uh, an engineering award. They start talking and they don't stop talking until the judge stops them. They're getting all their stuff in. So um, that was a tip that she had said that she had wished more Canadian teams would do, partially because um, the judges don't know as much about you as you think they do when they come up. They may never have heard of your team. They may be judging for the first time. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. So yeah, keep keep uh, both sides of it uh, from the perspective of someone walking up and never having met you before, um, that you are, as Param was explaining and as Anne and Ava explained, telling them everything they need to know to give you that award. Um, we're, we have time for a few questions, if there are any. Um, I'm not sure there would be. Um, there was so much information presented. But again, please feel free to contact um, Anne or Ava at Odyssey, and certainly Param at uh, the Alpha Dogs, they would be happy to help you in any way they could, as would pr pretty much any team that you would see in Ontario or even in the United States. So again, thank you everybody for all the, the great points that you're making today. Okay, so 
a couple of last things. So one of the things that we want to point out is we have this brand new thing Mr. Hobbins is responsible for um, called the Mobile Alumni Crew, and it's made up of experienced FRC alumni. So maybe you know some, maybe you have some graduated from your team, <coughs> Anne or Param, you might know people. And uh, basically, we're looking to send these people out to support teams, to support mentors predominantly, so that uh, uh, as good as the teams are in Ontario, we can make everybody even better. So if you have somebody to think about uh, that we think would fit that role, please contact Mr. Hobbins at the email indicated there. <clears throat> and again, as I was pushing Param earlier <laughs> in our pre-show, mm -hmm. uh, take advantage to sign up. Uh, I know when I was uh, a, a mentor of a team that I, that I had started back in 2012, one of the things I always said was, uh, you need to volunteer at events. We had so many great kids on our team, as I'm sure they do on uh, both the Alpha Dogs and Odyssey. But if the mentors on your team are the only people that know that you're a great kid, um, that's unfortunate. Get out so that Mr. Hobbins knows who you are, Mr. Bredner knows who you are, and all the FSMs know who you are, and the other teams know who you are, because you never know where that co-op placement's gonna come from, or that first job once you finish school is gonna come from, or the other awards that you might be able to win or the things that you might be able to, the opportunities, unless uh, people know who you are and can see from volunteering, um, uh, that's a great thing to do. And of course, as everybody knows, FIRST is a volunteer-driven organization. Um, I, I, one story I'd tell is, is I, um, I have a job I do at the, the World Championships. I usually do both of them. Um, and it's not to sell swag, as some people think. I do a different job. And I remember I was standing there in Houston at the very first event in Houston. I look out and I see two girls wearing First Canada hoodies who had come from Team 771 to volunteer at the first event in Houston, which was which was uh, unique. So, And they had volunteered at events in Ontario, so I knew who they were. But um, those kinds of things, you really want to consider that there's huge benefits to that. And you can see in the picture here, some of these are our regular volunteers. And of course, this one here on the, the left actually is a young lady that comes up from Texas to volunteer in, in Ontario at a couple of events. So I just want to thank, again, Team 7, 68, 78, and 49, 46, and Ava and Param uh, for the great job that they did. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this webinar is recorded. It will be posted once the recording is converted to MP4 up to our First Canada YouTube channel, and that link then will be provided to uh, through our uh, Facebook page, the First Canada Facebook page. And I think, as it occurs to me, as I was talking about Mrs. Bredner there um, and all the great stuff that she did in the, in the webinar that she did for us, that maybe I will post the link to that one from a couple of years ago so you can hear what she has to say about what judges see when they come to your pits. Next week, uh, it's me again, maybe. And um, on so on Tuesday the 25th at 7 p.m., we're gonna have two teams talking about uh, tips for your pits and robot inspection. If your team already doesn't have it, the robot inspection form is just came, just came out the other day, uh, I think on Friday. If you don't have it, uh, I sent it out to a few teams that was posted, but uh, let me know. You can email me at this address and ask uh, for me to send it out to you. I'd be happy to do that. Those people I talked to earlier about prizes, this is the email address I was mentioning to contact me at. And if ever you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or one of the other first senior mentors in your area, and we'd be happy to help you in any way we can. So once again, I'd like to thank um, everybody that was involved, both the presenters and the people online. And we wish you luck as you're going, some of you are going to be competing in a very short time at Durham. I think uh, uh, Param said 49-46 was going to be at that event as well. So good luck, Param. Thank you. Uh, I hope you do well. Good luck, Ava and Anne. I hope uh, you do uh, um well in your third year and uh, I hope to see both of you when I'm standing at registration in Detroit and uh, to see you at the World Championship. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, good night.